I'm, I'm very happy to be here and, uh, and thank you Enzo because in the conclusion, uh, uh, like your conclusion makes a lot of sense because in this presentation um, uh, I will speak about a, a concrete project where uh, well all the theoretical work uh, have, have been useful for industrial uh, purposes. So, um, so let's go for data pipeline engineering uh, made simple, uh, thanks to, to Scala. Uh, so my name is Raphael. I work at Creo, uh, which is um, a web advertisement. Uh, so it's a like commerce media platform uh, now because it builds tons of different products that are essentially uh, helping brands retailers, people who produce stuff, and people who want to monetize their website or their, uh, their stores uh, to work together. And so, a few numbers about this, this company, uh, which is a, a big player with a lot of hardware. Uh, so, so the, the stuff that are of, are of interest for, in the context of this talk will be the Hadoop cluster, so we have a uh, the largest, uh, uh, well, uh, public uh, Hadoop cluster in Europe with 3,000 nodes. And our offline data platform has uh, 200,000 tables of data. So it's a, a lot of data. And so our agenda will be introduction to data pipeline scheduling. Uh, uh, what, are the, what is this problem space? Then I'll talk about the project built by the, the team I work in, which is uh, the Criteo data platform. Uh, and in this part, we'll see a bit of Scala, and, and then we'll wrap up. So, data pipelines. I will use this example throughout the talk, uh, where you have some stores, let's say they, they sell uh, trees, uh, for the purpose of the example, and well, I have several stores, and they send the, the data to like home base, uh, where we can compute the aggregate of all the sales for a, a, a given tree, like a, a apple tree, how, how many I, did I sold. So, and I will uh, focus a bit on batch data pipelines, where I have some granularity of the data, and let's say the store, in fact, they send me the data daily, uh, at the end of the day when they close the door. There's, I can compute my aggregates daily, and because it's convenient to look at the data on a monthly basis, I can also uh, have the monthly aggregate. In this diagram, I, I bundle two things together. The job execution, so you have some code that, that will run to do the transformation, and its output, which is stored somewhere in a given format with a given schema. So what we can do then to, to look at this thing is to use a calendar view where I have data that comes in and then I compute the, the well, the aggregation, the, the downstream stuff. So for the first of January, second, up to the end of the month, and then I can compute my monthly aggregate. So a first kind of problem that you have with uh, data pipelines is backfill. You discover after the fact that, well, you had wrong data to start with. So what you need to do then is to backtrack everything that was computed from this wrong data and, and redo the computation to fix your data. So I, here I had to fix all my aggregates. Uh, another kind of problem that you have with data pipelines is schema changes. So let's say I have something that runs well, and at some point the team that works with my stores decide, okay, well, maybe we can change the, the data you send us because we, like, we have a better way. So they change it, and uh, let's say, what can happen if you have no support for schema management is, well, maybe no one told the team responsible for the aggregates that this change was done, and they might 
come up in the morning and discover, well, our pre-prod or our prod is broken uh, because our job is unable to read this new, this new data. Uh, so, in that situation, it's not comfortable. You have to fix the thing fast because, well, your prod is broken. Uh, so, yeah, I, maybe I could have started with this with a quick show of hand. Who, who has worked with data pipeline in their... Uh, uh, Okay, so half. Uh, that's nice. I have a, you have some understanding. And who who have seen this happen? Okay, yeah. Okay, I'm not the only one. <laughs> uh, so so yeah. So stuff to help you with this is uh, valuable. So yeah, you can fix it. Uh, you can then have further flavors of schema evolution problems. So. Now you, you have this sort of problem space, and what software did we use to run those jobs? So, well, in the very old days, we used generic scheduler because that was the only thing available. Uh, so, cron scheduler, but in, in cron scheduler, you, you had each job had to reinvent the wheel, uh, check its dependencies, handle retries, and, and all that kind of stuff. So, we quickly built some special purpose scheduler software. Um, at Credeo, it was Cuttle, which is a Scala library uh, available on GitHub. Uh, but the, the most famous one in this space is Airflow. Um, so those are nice. Those are SDKs, so you can extend them to do uh, all the shady stuff you want. They introduced this Skylander view uh, that we used, where you have time series jobs that depend on one another. And uh, a, a part of the success is they had built-in integration that help you like go go fast and, and not reinvent the wheel so fast. But well, there was still some issues with those. Well, first there is SDK, so so you had to create a project every time you you wanted to to, to use this. So you create an application, you need a database, you uh, so it's a bit of work. Then, in those, you had to first declare the dependencies of your job and then provide the code of your job. But you have no guarantee whatsoever that the two are coherent. You can very well, on purpose or by mistake, uh, read in your job code something else than what you declared. Then, no support for schema management. Uh, and testing either the job or the scheduling logic uh, was hard or like time consuming at least. So we've built layers on top of it to try to tackle those. Uh, one layer was uh, data flow. Uh, in the open source there is dbt, which sort of follows the same logic, where it's a, just a, a web page where you have like a wizard and formulas where you fill in some stuff and create standard jobs. So it's not very extensible, but it makes a data analyst very productive. So it was a great success for data analyst. And we built, we built another uh, layer uh, which was more targeted to maintainers of core jobs uh, and, and focused more on maintenance problem. So, Schema management, uh, dependency, consistency. So you see here that we start to have a fragmented ecosystem and, and none of those layers really solved all of our problems. So a uh, few years ago at Credo, some people brainstormed and, and said, okay, we, it would be great if we could ask our users to only write the task. And if from this task, we are able to statically infer the dependency graph, statically infer the schema of the output, then we can solve a lot of problems. And also, well, if we can launch tests uh, with like nothing to do than press a button, uh, it would be also not so. So yeah, with this, you, you can solve uh, lot, all, all the problems we had with the, the other stuff. And the idea we had, was to use SQL and leverage database query planning uh, in workflow management systems. So this 
I, I don't necessarily expect you to uh, understand this sentence at this point of the talk, uh, except if you're familiar with database query plans. But uh, if I do my job well, by the end of the talk, you, you, you'll make sense of this. So Credo Data Platform. So to introduce it, I have to first introduce this programming language. Uh, it's, it's just a SQL language with a, a bit of a custom addition to it. So we'll start at the bottom where you have a select from where. This, I assume you know, it creates an output with columns. Okay, then you have create data set, product sales, and this insert. So the idea is the output of the select, you don't throw it into scene here, you, you will store it as a data partition in a table. And then this weird stuff, which is heavily inspired from Scala, we, we have a four comprehension, 40 in time series, daily, two days. So the goal of this four comprehension is to yield a list of scope so that, in fact, you don't have a single query here, you have a list of query. So this four, you can execute it at a given time, let's say the 31st of March, and it will give you two execution scope for the 30 and the 31st. Thus, you have your two queries. Okay, so, well, language is nice, uh, but you have to implement the support for it. So, well, it's nice because we had talks yesterday about uh, Scalafix uh, and, and trees, and, and those sort of already introduced a bit some of the topics I, I'll, uh, I'll speak about here. So, well, to build a language, you, you have to start with a, a string that represents your, your text. Uh, from it, you, you get a list of token. Then you create a, a tree, a first tree, which is a concrete syntax tree. This concrete syntax tree, you can then go to a, an abstract syntax tree, uh, which then you can evaluate, uh, and, and we'll see that in our case, we, we don't necessarily evaluate everything ourselves. We can translate it to Spark SQL. Um, and, and all this kind of stuff. So let's, let's dive in. So first the lexer. Here you just chop the thing into a list of tokens where you already distinguish between reserved keywords, operators, white spaces, identifiers, this kind of stuff. And also, important, you capture the position of the tokens, which is very helpful to print nice error messages uh, like the one down there. Then, from the stream of token, you use the grammar rules of the SQL language to, that, that convey the structure uh, of the language, and you go from the list of tokens to the tree here. So we saw this already yesterday. So for those two stuff, you want to never fail. So expected nodes can be found or missing, and unexpected tokens, you accumulate them into invalid nodes. It's, it's very important so that you have errors only when you do the analysis to go to the AST. You don't have to handle the errors everywhere in your code. And the CST is a base for formatting and semantic analysis, so it does not discard any information. I mean, white space, comments, everything, you, you keep everything. So here we use fast parse, and in fact we use fast parse the, the version one, because version two and cat parse, unfortunately, are, are like specialized on string. So for the first lexer, it's nice, but to build a, a parser of a stream of token, well, you, you need something more general. Um, so, this library uh, is, is a parser combinator library. So, the name implies it, but so in a parser combinator uh, thing, you build pers parser for uh, small stuff, like a keyword creates. This is a, a parser of something very simple. And you 
combine them, uh, saying you have this after this, or you have this or this, or this part is optional, and, and you combine them to build bigger parsers that in the end can, can convey the, the whole language. Uh, uh, it's very nice. The only limitation is, uh, well, you, if you have a huge uh, input, like a one gigabyte SQL query, humans get creative, uh, you, you, you have to, your parser doesn't speed the output of the parsing uh, on, the, on the go, so you, you have to be able to, to store every, the output entirely in memory. But for our purpose, no, not a problem at all. Um, so once you have this concrete syntax tree, you might want to format it uh, back to a SQL string, uh, but nicely formatted, uh, which we we'll all appreciate. And here we use the pages library from uh, the type level uh, org. Uh, and, it's, and it's very nice, and it was mentioned yesterday, building a formatter yourself is, is something very tricky. Uh, to get right, so this stuff is um, in fact a, a f uh, like a port of a, a Haskell library uh, with a paper uh, that describes the, the gory detail, but as a user, it's very nice to use. You have to create document uh, uh, objects that are the pieces of stuff that can be splitted or not. You can put line returns where you want them to happen and then once you aggregate the document by just uh, concatenating them, you can just play render with a given line length and you'll have your nice formatting. Uh, very recommended, this library. So the beefy stuff. So once you have your CST, you have some other uh, like context and, and for SQL it's the available catalog of data. And then what you do is you walk through the CST nodes and you analyze them to produce either an AST part, an abstract center tree part, or some errors. So uh, with a concrete example, I, I spared you the CST version of it, so select name from BI core fancy dimension, where ID equal ABC. So you go from to, to this one where you have an identified that name is a reference to the fancy dim table. Uh, dot name colon, uh, same for the ID, and well, you did not produce an error, so you also checked, for example, that the equality expression uh, makes sense because ID is of a time string that can be compared with the ABC string. And here we use uh, the cats library, where in fact our, so yeah, it's at the bottom of the screen, sorry. Um, but the, our analyzed type in our code base is in fact just an alias to the validated uh, nail thing from cats. So let me introduce this thing. First, I have to introduce non-empty list, uh, which is a, a data type from this library. So if you work with a list, you will always have to handle the case where it might be empty. Non-empty list is a very convenient thing where because you moved the check at the creation of the list, well, when you work with an empty list, you, you don't have to bother about this thing. So that's not an empty list. And then validated. Validated is uh, some type, like it's an either, in fact, where you have the happy pass and the unhappy pass. So uh, either you have a non empty list of errors, of SQL errors, or you have your piece of AST. And the difference with an either is it can be used uh, like the following. So if I'm at one node in my concrete syntax tree, I have all the branches done, done this node. Uh, and here it's in this tuple where I have a, so it's a copy function call. I have a name, data file, table name. Uh, there is six of them, so I have a tuple with six branches, and I have this map end function. And what happens here is either I have 
all of the elements of my tuples that are valid cases, and thus I get the valid uh, branch and I can construct my AST node, or there might be some that are invalid, and in that case, I don't have to write the code for it, validate it does it for me. The, all the non-empty list of errors are accumulated into a single list of errors. So um, that's it. Uh, then I have my AST, happy pass, I have a, a valid AST. What I can do with it is pretty printed. You already saw the output of this. It's very useful in our test. We, we use it very heavily uh, and it's useful for our analysis. We also need to evaluate the AST. So, for example, we have to evaluate this for comprehension thing uh, because it's like its own creation. So, uh, to produce and yield the, the list of partitions. What we also do is we can transpile uh, part of our AST to Spark SQL. Uh, in the beginning of the project, it was Hive SQL, but we 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 switched. Um, so, uh, for a given uh, execution scope, we we have this uh, AST, and it can be translated to to Spark SQL. And that's it. We've seen uh, the whole SQL language thing, and uh, all that was needed and used to to implement it. So now let's leverage this thing to do dependency resolution. So we'll take the, this query again, so for the 31st of March. And so this query produces one partition uh, as an output. And the question is, which partitions does it depend on? So maybe let me read through the query. So you have a select product ID, then you have some aggregation because you have a group by down there on product ID, so you aggregate the number of sales and the revenue from store sales where uh, the day is the 31st of March. So what partition does this query depend on? It's, someone has uh, an idea. No? Okay, I, I have another question. Where, where do you look to find the answer? I, I know some of you d know SQL uh, for sure uh, because of the show of hands, so. Yeah, exactly, in the where part. So, uh, and in fact, uh, my question was uh, not so great because you missed some information to, to answer me. So, you looked into the the where clause, the, the from where clause. And well, this store sale thing, uh, we apply a filter on, on its data. So we have to take the definition of the store sale table, which is here. We look at the for comprehension thing to get the list of partition in this table. And what we can do then is we can just run our filter on this list and find out that, well, the partitions I depend on are the ones for the 31st of March, for the Detroit store and the Paris store. And so here we also use our ability to evaluate some part of our IST. Uh, so here the evaluation was trivial, but it can be a bit more complex, you can have uh, uh, function calls, like for the scalar function, like date sub, uh, and operators like between and, and this kind of stuff. The output of this dependency resolution for two of uh, the queries we have in production can look like this. You get uh, those list of, okay, different tables and different partitions in, in those tables. So now, let's look at the scheduling problem. So, which partition needs to be computed? Well, we have those four comprehensions that describe the theoretical listing of partition that should exist at a given point in time. 
So for the 31st of March, I saw for my table, I, I, I was supposed to have two, two partitions. And then you have reality. So you have your data catalog. In Creo, it's the Hive Metastore. And, and you can look in there what actually exists. And well, to know what you need to compute, you just take the theoretical listing, the actual one, and everything that's missing is what you need to compute. OK. And then, well, can you actually compute what you need to compute? Well, it depends. Are the partition depended on available? Uh, in this case, yes, everything is green. In this case, you see there is one in gray, so no, not yet. This one, I can't launch it already. So, yeah, what do I need to launch? Well, the ones that uh, are, are not yet uh, available and where all the partition are available, so I can, I can do it. So here we use the FS2 library. Um, uh, and so I have, I have a bit of time, so I can, I, I can dig in a little in, in there. So you have first a function uh, where we use the FS2 stream, have wake every, um, and then we run an I.O. So this function is just to run some piece of code every so often, every uh, five minutes, let's say. And then underneath, uh, you have flow.node. So for all the data set in our thing, so today we have uh, 5,000 of them uh, in, the, in the platform. So every... Uh, so five minutes, well, for all the, the data sets, you, you run this thing where every five minutes you, you check what I just said, like, are the partition uh, all available? No? Okay. Can I compute the ones that needs to be computed? And that's it. So, and you run this concurrently. So, so this code is not very interesting by itself, but the message I have here is, well, it, in our code base, we have very little code that deals with concurrency. And, and this is uh, the, the great stuff about FS2 and, and a bit of cat's effect that we use for uh, concurrent stuff. And yeah, FS2 is, is always amaze me. Uh, maybe it's because um, I, like I was taught at university uh, concurrent programming using uh, VxWorks uh, and, and like a, a real-time operating system when you work with C code and uh, you have to handle uh, uh, all the memory exchange between your threads and so on. So the level of abstraction of FS2 in contrast is, is, is amazing. So yeah, every time I use this library, I'm like, wow. Um, yeah, and I guess it was a message uh, uh, for this slide. So, so yeah, I've we've covered uh, OSQ language and what uh, benefit we get from it. And so the takeaways are, well, we have those nice uh, libraries that I've covered, uh, fast parse to do parsing, so parser combinator library. Pages, uh, if you want to, to build a, a formatter for your uh, thing, a language, a, a configuration thing. Or. Uh, cats, uh, so type classes are, are very nice. Uh, in, in my experience, it's, it's uh, for newcomers, it's using data types such as those uh, in, in, in my teams. Uh, it's a very nice introduction, a segue into the cats library. Um, so that's why I focus on those. Uh, FS2 uh, for, for concurrent A. And uh, well, I've walked through you through this thing where I, I use the where clause to, to understand what are the dependencies. And this is part of what happens in database query planner. So there is a lot more that happens, but uh, so. We, we saw that the database query plans uh, can be very useful to tackle some of the 
data pipeline scheduler usability issue we had in the past. Um, so yeah, I, I hope it's a bit clearer this sentence now. And and with this, that's it. And we have time uh, even for questions. So that's very nice. Um, I have a question about the scheduling part. Um, I was wondering if you have um, multiple instances of the same applications that have the uh, awake every uh, duration. Um, how do you manage the fact that uh, multiple instances of this application might trigger at the same time, uh, triggering the, the same computations? So. The answer is we don't have several instances. Um, so it's, it's a platform, so everybody puts the data definition in, in the same place. And, and thus we have a single instance of our scheduler, which uh, in the end does a lot of heavy work, but it just launched like one Hadoop jobs every second, like one Spark job every second uh, on the cluster, so it's like, uh, for now and for the foreseeable future, uh, we don't need to fan out. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, so, if I understood well, in the end, you will use Spark to execute your SQL requests, right? Yes. Um, so my question is, uh, why don't you use the, directly in Scala the SQL, the Spark SQL API to code your uh, business rules and then instead of interpreting SQL uh, with parsing, etc., uh, using this tool to know uh, what, the part what are the, the input partitions what are the, the input data, et cetera? Um, yeah, okay. So, um, so the big data, so the, the, the big data flow uh, platform, in fact, doesn't have a, a, a state of its own and entirely rely on the meta store as, a, as a, its state. So we could do, we could very well do what you describe, but uh, Spark SQL has support for Hive Metastore catalog. Therefore, we we don't have to do it. <laughs> we we can just uh, we, so we don't do it. We just uh, uh, rely on the Spark engine to talk with the Metastore and, and uh, but yeah. Um, Uh, first, thank you for the talk. I have a question. Did you have a look at uh, Databricks Delta Life tables? It's pretty similar, uh, but it's a closed solution. So I guess uh, maybe you can uh, uh, get some inspiration from their work. They also use SQL uh, through uh, our Python API for scheduling, and they run their job on top of Spark, as you did. Uh, so I just uh, wanted to ask if you took a look. Uh, so when we created this project, uh, now it's been uh, uh, five years, uh, this stuff was not available. Um, and and we have other benefits to that we can build our own like, so um, when, when problem with SQL language is uh, the expressivity is limited and uh, well it can this expressivity can be extended with uh, user defined functions uh, where you can encode your, your business logic with um, table functions like 
the run Python code uh, you mentioned. Uh, and something we use heavily also is you table functions to run business logic which is specific to our, our company, which is, for example, export or import table from MySQL, uh, from uh, SFTP, uh, and this kind of stuff. And uh, uh, yeah, this, because we run on our own hardware and infrastructure, uh, th this is very valuable, uh, but yeah, maybe we could rebuild it today on, on uh, Databricks offering. Is Databricks offering uh, uh, free or like? Uh, no, uh, okay. it's not free. Definitely not. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess if we have. Uh, no more question, uh, we can have a, a break now. Uh, uh, and if you have further question, uh, don't hesitate to, 